I don't like to brag, but I shook Mises' hand. <laughs> and I never washed the hand since. <laughs> so if you, it, the hand's a little dirty, but if you shake my hand, you channel Mises. <laughs> my topic today is praxeology. And um, Andrew Napolitano, the judge, talked about legal positivism. There is also such a thing called logical positivism. And uh, as libertarians, we oppose legal positivism, but as Austrians, we oppose logical positivism. What is logical positivism? Logical positivism is the view that economics and all social sciences, but I'm mainly concerned with economics, is an empirical science, just like chemistry, physics, astronomy, any other physical science. And in those sciences, there are no laws. Even the law of gravity is not a law, it's really just a hypothesis. And what a hypothesis is, is you generalize from experience, and then you make a hypothesis, and then you test it. And if the test comes out okay, you don't say that it's a law, you just say, well, the hypothesis has not yet been refuted. So we provisionally accept it. We provisionally accept gravity, we provisionally accept uh, H2O is water, things like that. There are no laws, because a law is something that if you disagree with, it's like a logical contradiction. And there are no laws like the Pythagorean theorem in mathematics. If you take a triangle and you take the uh, right triangle and you take the square of the sides and add them up and it uh, doesn't equal the square of the hypotenuse, what do we say? Do we say, well, you know, it's uh, uh, the Pythagorean theorem isn't really a law? No, we say you don't have a, an accurate triangle. Go out and do it again until you get it right. Uh, because the uh, Pythagorean theorem is a law. Two plus two is a law. You can't contradict that. Now, in, in uh, the way I see it, uh, we have Austrian economics here, and we have neoclassical economics here. We have a Venn diagram, and there is an overlap, and I don't mean, uh, maybe I should put it this way so that, um, I don't know, uh, I'm not really trying to talk about how much of an overlap there is, just that there is an overlap. And let's suppose we have A, B, and C. And A would be laws, where the neoclassicists do not uh, allow for. And B would be the overlap, where the neoclassicists and the Austrians uh, sort of agree. You take a right-wing neoclassicist, Chicago school, and they will agree on B, such as uh, minimum wage uh, creates unemployment for unskilled workers, uh, rent control uh, ruins housing, things like that. Free trade is uh, beneficial. But the difference between the A and B is that for us Austrians, the A part are laws, whereas for these people, they're only hypotheses. So when Cardin Kruger come out with something on the minimum wage law saying that, well, it really doesn't create unemployment for unskilled workers, what they mean it is as a hypothesis, and you have to test it. Whereas for the Austrians, what we say is if you have a minimum wage law of uh, $10 an hour, then assuming profit and maximizing behavior, unemployment for uh, unskilled workers will be higher than it otherwise would have been. Well, if it's higher than otherwise would have been, how do we know what it would otherwise have been? We don't. So you can't test this. Whereas for those people, uh, hypotheses live or die based on, on uh, the latest uh, empirical um, test. Let me give you a, a bunch of examples. I get a lot of this from my colleague, friend, buddy, Hans Hoppe who is a real rabbit on this point, and uh, all of us follow him and Mises and Rothbard on these things. Uh, suppose I trade you this tie for your pen. We're going to have a, a swap. Here's your pen, here's my tie. If you agree to it, I can deduce logically, necessarily, apodictically, that there's something about this tie that you like more than your pen, and if I also do it, 
agree to the trade. There's something about the pen of your pen that I like more than this tie. So when we do it, when we make the trade, we necessarily, in the ex-ante sense, gain. And we evaluate the two objects in, in opposite ways. Now, how do you test that? You can't test that. If you understand the English language, you understand that, that this is uh, untestable, this is apodictic, this is necessarily true. To deny this is to commit some sort of logical contradiction. Now, it might be, see, I don't know why you like this time. Maybe you think that if you make the trade, I'll give you an A in the course. But there's no course here, <laughs> and I can't give you an A or any other mark, so you're mistaken. So I'm not saying why you like the tie or why I like the pen. Maybe I think that if I make this trade, you'll be my best friend forever or something like that. Who knows? We don't know the psychology of it. All we know is that there's something about this that you, pref you rank them this way, and there's something about the thing that I rank them this way, and that there's mutual gain and a benefit in the ex ante sense. Okay, so that's one example. Another example is that there's a tendency for profits to fall to zero in the evenly rotating economy, but profits are never zero because we're never in the e evenly rotating economy. Another one is that there's a tendency for profits to be the same in all industries, such that if in industry A there's 50% profit, in industry B there's 10% profit, in industry C there's minus 20% profit, there will be a tendency for resources to leave the low profit thus raising the profit, and enter the high profit, thus pushing down the profit uh, level in the, in the high profit industry, such that there's a tendency for them to be equal, but tendencies can't be falsified. Because at any given time, there'll be differences in profits, but that doesn't falsify the idea of a tendency. Another one is um, rent control uh, leads to um, misallocation of resources. Let me tell you a little story about this. I was doing my PhD dissertation with uh, Gary Becker, a Nobel Prize winner, and uh, not only a Nobel Prize winner, but perhaps one of the most famous ones because he applied economics to a whole bunch of areas in sociology, which previously, at least in the mainstream, had been the provenance of, uh, of sociologists, and now he was applying it to the economics of crime and marriage and a uh, choice of whether to have a baby or not and all sorts of things like that. So anyway, I'm doing my dissertation, and um, uh, it's got some sort of econometric uh, equation of the sort. Um, uh, amount of rent, con uh, it's y equals a plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus some sort of error term. And here is amount of rent control, and here is housing... Uh, quality or shortages or what have you. And my thesis was that the more rent control you have, uh, the, the, the less quality of housing you'll have. So I expected a negative um, uh, coefficient there. And most of my econometric results were correct. I got a negative sign for the um, x1 independent variable. And uh, most of the time it was statistically significant and I was doing well. Every once in a rare while, though, I would get the wrong sign, which indicates the more rent control, the better the housing quality, holding constant other things like this that would uh, also impact housing quality, say, uh, such as wealth or uh, weather or whatever. And every once in a while, horribly, the, uh, the wrong sign was statistically significant. So if Gary Becker was really a the neoclassical economist that he thinks he is, if he was really the logical positivist, the person who believes in testing uh, economic uh, hypotheses, he would say, oh, I've got this young genius. I was young in those days. I don't know what happened. I used to be the enfant terrible, but now I'm an old duffer. Boy, it goes fast when you're having fun. In any case, <laughs> in any case, uh, he didn't say that. He said, he was too polite to say this, but this is what he really meant. What he really meant was block you moron, go out again and get it, do it again until you get it right. So what was testing what? Was my um, stupid econometric equation system testing what we know about rent control? That uh, you know that if you have a um, uh, what do you call it? A, a price ceiling. There's the supply. There's the demand. Quantity price. You're going to have shortages, and you're going to have all sorts of messes with the housing uh, problem. 
Well, was my uh, uh, econometric equation testing this? No. The Austrian view would be that it's illustrating this. Now, here I have a slight disagreement with my colleague and friend Jeff Herbener, who thinks that all of this stuff is just a snare and a delusion, and it's um, uh, improper uh, to even use econometrics. I'm a moderate. He's such an extremist. I don't know. He, he, he looks mild-mannered, but he's real extremist, and I'm the moderate here. That's why they call me Walter Moderate Block. <laughs> Uh, he says it's of no use whatsoever. And I say, and I, I think I speak for most of my colleagues, that there's nothing wrong with this per se. It's rather all in the interpretation of it. Uh, the interpretation is we're not testing economic law. We're illustrating economic law. And sometimes the illustrations come out right, and sometimes they come out wrong. And when they come out wrong, there's nothing wrong with the economic law. There's something wrong with the uh, econometric equation. Uh, very similar with the Cardin Kruger kind of thing. When Cardin Kruger came out and said that the minimum wage law really helps um, uh, unskilled workers, um, Gary Becker and the Chicago types, not, not the, the, the left wing um, neoclassicals like Stiglitz, who favored the minimum wage, although there's an interesting story there. Stiglitz was once interviewed. And uh, the interviewer was a bright journalist and said, look, uh, Professor Stiglitz, in your textbook, you give the ordinary uh, stuff about minimum wage law that, you know, it creates unemployment for unskilled workers. And yet you sign this uh, uh, petition saying we should raise the minimum wage law to help uh, unskilled workers. How do you reconcile that? And Stiglitz went on for about five minutes yakking, and I couldn't understand a word he was saying. It was the most amazing thing. Uh, he really was caught with his pants down around his ankles, intellectually speaking, and he really didn't have a leg to stand on, but he's got a good BS uh, ability, and he just BS'd his way out of that, but um, horrendous. Gary Becker and um, uh, the other um, Chicago types, Milton Friedman, uh, who also... Uh, take the, the logical positivist view. When Cardin and Kruger came out with their stuff, they didn't say, oh, well, you know, maybe um, uh, economic law doesn't work in New Jersey. Ask Joe Salerno. He's from New Jersey, and all sorts of weird things go on in New Jersey. So maybe economic law didn't work there, or it works differently or something. No, they didn't say that. So what I'm trying to say is that if you scratch a good neoclassical economist, they're really Austrians. But you have to scratch hard, because they don't... Um, they don't understand this somehow. I got into a little debate with Gary Becker again, and uh, he called Austrian economics a cult and a religion. And I took umbrage at this, and we had a back and forth on this. It's, uh, if you're interested, I can email it to you or just Google Gary Becker, Walter Block, Austrian cult, something like that, and you'll get this debate we had. And I was trying to, you know, convince him, and I didn't do too well because he, he recently passed away, and he, uh, he's not going to heaven, <laughs> or at least economic heaven, because he, he wasn't an Austrian, <laughs> and only Austrians will get to economic heaven. <laughs> I have to tell you a story about Jim Buchanan. Now, um, my colleague and friend and many times co-author Tom D. Lorenzo spoke about Buchanan. I have a little different view of Buchanan. I'm a professor at Loyola University, and uh, we invite scholars to come and present to our students. Uh, Eric, were you here when Buchanan, uh, were, were you at Loyola when Buchanan came? No, okay, this is before Eric's time. He's one of my students now. And uh, I disagree with Buchanan on a lot of things. Uh, I don't like this uh, rent-seeking business. I mean, what they, what they mean by rent-seeking is theft. And yet they don't distinguish between theft and, and ordinary uh, behavior. Uh, you know that joke, do you know the difference between uh, the bathroom and the living room? And if you say no, the answer is don't come to my house. <laughs> well, if you don't know the difference between theft and a voluntary interaction, I say don't come into political economy. And these people, the, the uh, public choicers, they don't know the difference between um, theft and uh, taxes on the one hand and voluntary interaction on the other. 
Uh, later in one of my lectures, I'll accuse Coase of this, uh, Ronald Coase, another famous neoclassical economist. But uh, the, the point is that they call rent-seeking something that is really pernicious and evil, and why do they pick on the word rent? I mean, rent is innocuous. There's the economic rent, and there's renting a car or an apartment. Why call it rent-seeking? So it sort of ticks me off. In any case, I had some disagreements with Buchanan, and I invited him to Loyola to speak, and I promised myself I wouldn't ambush him. Because I'm the host, you know, you're not supposed to invite someone, unless it's a formal debate, then you can kick butt. But uh, if it's just uh, an invitation, you know, you, you sort of be nice. And I, I was nice, and he was uh, mouthing off about all sorts of uh, irrationalities from my point of view. Although, uh, as um, Roger, uh, as um, Tom DiLorenzo said, uh, he was good on cost and choice. He he was sort of Austrian, but he's a little strange. So anyway, uh, you know you know it's hot outside, and if I were to say it's hot outside, it would be sort of innocuous and undebatable. And the the way he, uh, that's what he said about Austrianism. You know, Austrian is a cult, and then he was going to go on to something else, as if you know it's warm outside. So I went into a five or ten minute diatribe, you know, just just sort of jumping down his throat, and I was ready to you know get it on intellectually. Uh, uh, of course, he was bigger than me, so I don't want to fight him. But uh, and then he didn't say anything. But it was very. Um, uh, uh, very frustrating. The, the point is, the, the neoclassical people see Austrian as a cult or a religion, and they don't mean this as positive, because of praxeology. Because we believe that there are certain laws in economics of the sort that I've mentioned to you that are not testable. And then they say, if it's not testable, well, then it's not science. Milton Friedman uh, said that if two neoclassicists disagree with one another... Uh, well, they'll just go back and uh, run the regression again or do some more empirical uh, work. Whereas if two Austrian economists uh, disagree, they can only fight. <laughs> can you imagine Mises and Rothbard fighting, you know, duking it out over some economic theorem? I mean, the whole thing is silly. Uh, it's as if uh, when two symbolic logicians disagree, they have to fight. When two geometricians disagree over the Pythagorean theorem or something like that, they have to fight? No, that's silly. It's a matter of logic, and um, you just go back to the premises and see where one or the other or both made some sort of mistake. So these I regard as slurs against um, Austrian economics. Okay, I want to now talk about a whole bunch of other things where Austrians disagree with uh, neoclassicists, uh, sort of a rundown of uh, various um, other uh, things uh, beside praxeology. But I regard praxeology as the most important, unique part of Austrianism. The rest of the stuff about uh, uh, coordination and market process and this and that and the other, I think are important, um, but are not crucial. I once gave a speech on Austrian economics a, a, a week or a month after a, an economist from George Mason did, and people said, you know, it's as if two different Austrian Austrianisms, and they really are. There's the, um, uh, the way I would see it, there's the Menger, Bombavirk, Mises, Rothbard group, and then there's the Menger, Bombavirk, Hayek, Kersner group, which is subtly different. Uh, the people at George Mason, for example, are on the Hayek side, and Hayek was not a praxeologist. Hayek said he does not follow Mises uh, on this praxeology stuff. Uh, Hayek uh, was quoted as saying, well, I, I think Hayek was a splendid Austrian economist. He was very, very good on, um, on uh, business cycles, and um, uh, although I have some problems with the Hayekian triangle, and, and I, uh, I often mention Roger Garrison, who's sitting there as um, uh, Hayek's chief lieutenant, or, uh, uh, and, and Roger made a very good point about inverting the triangle and putting time on the uh, horizontal axis, which makes it more amenable for the neoclassists to understand, whereas the, the way the Hayek triangle, he had time on the, on the vertical axis. But... Um, here we have another disagreement, the, the Keynesians, and uh, on the Keynesians, I include the right-wing Friedmanite Monterist Keynesians and also the left-wing uh, Keynesian Keynesians as Keynesians, uh, because what they both, all versions of Keynesianism, believe is that we have a market failure. 
And the market failure is that the economy is sort of like a car, and it's riding along the road, and it's uh, always going to veer off either into inflation or to unemployment. And the role of the, the government, the role of the Fed, the role of the central bank is to keep the car on the straight and narrow. And when it veers off into inflation, we have to cut back. And when it veers off into inflation, uh, rather, when it veers off into unemployment, we have to boost the uh, uh, step on the gas. When it veers off into um, uh, inflation, we have to step on the monetary or the fiscal break. That, uh, that's the, uh, the main difference between the two is one of the monetarists and one of the fiscalists, but they have the same view that the economy is um, uh, unstable, uh, uh, the free market is unstable, and, and the government has to uh, keep the, the car on the, on the straight and narrow. Uh, Arthur Burns was once asked at a, a conference that Murray Rothbard was at, well, suppose we have both. Suppose we have uh, unemployment and inflation. Then what do we do? And Arthur Burns said, well, ha, 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 that'll never happen. We'll resign. Well, <laughs> it happened. It's called stagflation, and they never, uh, uh, they never did resign. Whereas the Austrian has a, a, a very different view. The Austrian view is that... Um, uh, there are uh, market forces that will uh, prevent, if we have a pure free enterprise economy without any government or central banks or any, anything else, uh, that there'll be neither uh, unemployment nor inflation. And the reason that we have one or the other or both is because of uh, central banking and fractional reserve banking, although fractional reserve banking is a uh, little debatable among Austrians, but the, the Rothbardian view is that fractional reserve banking uh, does uh, create the uh, or lead to the uh, business cycle. So that's a second disagreement where Austrians and neoclassicals uh, diverge. So that would be part of the um, uh, the C versus A business, where the Austrians have a view on praxeology and on business cycles, and the other guys have um, the opposite view or a very, uh, very different view. Okay, another one is uh, spontaneous order. Austrians are uh, very strong on spontaneous order, where something occurs which is not the result of any uh, human intention, but it just sort of uh, happens like topsy, for example, language. Uh, language is a spontaneous order. Nobody, uh, you know, the caveman, one caveman said, ugh, and the other said, ugh, a booga booga or something. And, and this became a language, even though uh, the intent of each speaker was not to create a language, but rather to just, you know, uh, help in cooperating, uh, killing the buffalo or whatever they were doing. Money is also a spontaneous uh, order. Uh, people uh, engaged in um, uh, uh, barter. And uh, then it became uh, difficult because of the double coincidence of wants. Uh, you know, if I have a, a chicken and I want a pickle, uh, the idea of finding uh, the odds of me finding someone who's got a pickle and wants a chicken are very low. So what I'll do is I'll take my chicken and I'll trade it for something that I think most people want, like salt or sugar or fish hooks or whatever. And I'll make two trades where I could have made one, but the, the one would be very difficult because of the double coincidence of wants. So... Uh, I make two trades, and now the question is, well, what will be the trade intermediation? Will it be sugar, salt? Will it be fish hooks? Will it be clamshells? And whenever uh, people were free to choose their trade intermediation, it usually uh, evolved toward gold and maybe sometimes silver. Uh, Friedman uh, had a, a series, a TV series, Free to Choose, which was good in many ways, but uh, when people were free to choose, they chose gold, and yet he is adamantly opposed to gold, and uh, so it's sort of a little inconsistent there on his part. Okay, another one is entrepreneurship. Uh, Austrians uh, uh, focus on entrepreneurship. For Austrians, entrepreneurship is very, very important. If you look at an intro or an intermediate uh, economics textbook, uh, some of the, and you look in the back in the index, some of them will have entrepreneurship and it'll be like one page or two pages, and some of them won't even have it. Rather, they'll focus on land, labor, and capital. Whereas for the Austrian, uh, the entrepreneur is very, very important. Um, uh, Israel Kersner wrote a book, Competition and Entrepreneurship, a very important book. There are disputes among Austrians uh, about this. Uh, Murray Rothbard special, um, uh, uh, emphasized the capitalist entrepreneur, 
whereas uh, Kersner emphasized the uh, pure entrepreneur. And the problem with the pure entrepreneur, somebody who has no capital, no skin in the game, is he can't make losses. And for the entrepreneur, it's profit and loss, not just profit. Whereas the Kersner version of this, it's hard to see how you can make a loss if you don't have any money invested in, in, the, in the enterprise. Another one is ordinal and cardinal. Um, the uh, Austrians uh, believe in um, ordinal utility, ordering things, ranking things. Uh, that, that would be uh, legitimate. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, I rank um, uh, my wristwatch first, my tie second, and, and this pen third. Uh, that's okay. No problem with that. But the uh, mainstream uh, look at uh, utility, not so much, although they do agree with ordinal, but they add cardinal, and cardinal is counting, and now you have utils. So for example, if you have a... Um, a curve like this, and, and you put a utility here and say money over there, and you have diminishing margin utility of money. The idea is that if you're very rich, uh, the last dollar doesn't mean that much to you. If you're very poor, the, um, uh, the first dollar or the uh, um, uh, introductory dollar uh, is much more important. But whenever you put utility on an axis, uh, what you have is you're measuring, and it's not first, second, and third, and fifth, and 19th. It's 10, 20, 30 utils, but there are no utils. Yes, we, uh, we have measurements of height and weight and speed and velocity and all sorts of things that are legitimate, temperature, Celsius, Fahrenheit, whatever. We're, we're not against the measurement, but there's no units of happiness. There are no happies. Uh, <laughs> there are no utils. Uh, you can't. Say, I can say that uh, I like the watch more than the uh, the time, more than the pen. But I can't say the watch has 10, 20 utils. This has ten utils, and this has five utils. And therefore, I like this twice as much as this, and this twice as much as that, and this four times as much as that. That's just nonsense on a on a stick or whatever. Uh, nonsense, not a pogo stick. Uh, what is it? Nonsense. Where is nonsense supposed to be? On stilts, that's it, thanks. I need all, I'm getting senile, I, I need all the help I can get. Uh, nonsense on stilts. Uh, I thought a pogo stick was pretty good. Nonsense on a pogo stick. Uh, and then you get all sorts of implications. For example, if you take money away from the rich guy and now he's a little less rich, and you give money to the poor guy and now the poor guy is a little wealthier, that somehow we have, if you take the two of them as the total of society, now society is richer because this guy loses only this many utils and this guy gains all those utils and the difference between them is a net gain. And this is an intellectual justification of uh, welfare. And not, well, not corporate capitalist welfare or, or <clears throat> crony capitalism or corporate welfare, but you know ordinary, uh, plain old ordinary welfare. Uh, one of the problems with this is that um, as, um, uh, what's his name, Charles Murray says in his book, Losing Ground, the problem with this is that uh, it tends to break up the family, especially the black family. Uh, the example I sometimes use to illustrate this is that um, if you throw a frog in boiling water, It'll jump out. Its metabolism is such that it recognizes and jumps out. If you put a frog in cold water and heat it up slowly, it stays there and, and gets boiled. Well, slavery for the black family was like boiling water. Yes, it ruined the black family during slavery, but after slavery, the black family coalesced, got back together in the 1860s and 1870s and 80s. There were ads in the paper, you know, Emily Lou, where are you? This is Joe. Uh, I was put in this plantation. Let's get together. The 1900 and 1910 census, the black and white family were about as intact as each other. And then came, uh, uh, what's it called, LBJ with his Great Society in 1965. There was always welfare before that, but he really ramped it up. And uh, that broke up the black family because uh, Charles Murray made the point that uh, uh, young girls would uh, marry the state because the state could make them a better financial offer than um, uh, the, not their husband, the, the father of their child. And it's not a black-white thing. Uh, Sweden uh, has welfare state and... Uh, their family is breaking up, and they're mostly white. And even now, uh, days with whites, the, the family formation is uh, very less. Um, 
what is it, I think three quarters of black kids are now brought up in non-intact families, which creates all sorts of havoc. Okay, so that's one problem with this welfare. Another problem with this welfare business is who says that they're on the same curve? Maybe, maybe they're on, 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 this is the rich curve, and this is the poor curve, and maybe what you're doing when you take money away from the rich guys, you, you're reducing uh, welfare by that, and you're only giving the poor guy this. So if I drew it a little better, I think you can see that the, in, you're now taking more utils away from the rich guy than the poor guy, right? Uh, is it clear from my diagram? Slightly more. And uh, in other words, even if you adopt their nonsensical view of utils, uh, it still doesn't follow that we should take money from the rich and give it to the poor, which is really normative economics, not positive economics, which is a different um, realm of discourse. Okay, where else do we Austrians diverge from them bar neoclassicists? Another one is math. Um, mo you look at the journals nowadays and it's all math and all statistics, American Economic Review, very heavily mathematical. What's the Austrian view on math? The problem that, uh, and here I'm, uh, I'm sort of a Herban, Herbanerian, Herbanerian, yeah, that would make it right. I, I think that uh, math is a snare and a delusion for economics. Why? Because, uh, uh, to do math, you have to have uh, smooth curves. And um, Murray Rothbard has one of the most beautiful things. Uh, what, you see, uh, here is um, an average cost curve. Notice that it's a um, uh, smooth curve. And there's quantity, there's price. And now you have a demand curve. And um, you can see that you're at point A, not at point B, but point B is the most efficient. And uh, this is sort of the, um, how shall I say it, the, uh, the bedrock of antitrust economics, that if you have a downward sloping demand curve, you don't have perfect competition, uh, you're not going to have efficiency, and, and we have to have perfect competition so that we can be at point B, which is the low point on the average cost curve. So what Murray does, is there any more paper here? I'm running out of paper? Oh, I got one more sheet. So I, I'll, I'll use, no, I can't use the other sign. So what Murray does beautifully in Man, Economy, and State, the most gorgeous diagram ever, what Murray does is he goes like this. And that's the average cost curve. N namely, it's sort of a reductio ad absurdum. And he says, look, um, <laughs> the, 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 whole, uh, the whole idea here follows from smooth curves. That, if you didn't have a smooth curve, you could be at the low point. And now he draws a non-smooth curve. It's true you can't have a tangency, but they can touch. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Uh, it, it just shows that, that the whole... Uh, it, it's sort of like the mathematical dog is waving the economic tail. And we're economists. We should be the dog and, and wave the mathematical tail. Uh, namely, we're economists. We're not mathematicians, uh, at least in this regard, although Murray was a gifted mathematician, but that's a whole other uh, kind of an issue. Uh, so we have nothing against math, God forbid, having anything against mathematics, but what we have is the, uh, against or oppose is the... Uh, um, uh, I, I guess Donald Trump wouldn't like the immigration of math into economics. You know, kick those mathematicians out. They're all the rapists and uh, <laughs> whatever else uh, Donald Trump is accusing the Mexicans of, we can accuse the mathematicians of. Well, not really, not really rape, but, um, uh, uh, but mischief, mischievous um, behavior uh, of, you know, perverting uh, antitrust economics by making this sort of a curve. Okay, what else do we have? Oh, another one is market failure. These uh, um, mainstream people, they love market failure. Um, the main market failures are, what are the main market failures? I guess, um, well, uh, unemployment, the business cycle is a market failure. Um, monopoly is, is a market failure. Um, uh, public goods are a market failure. Externalities are a market failure. I once didn't have much to write. I, I now have so many projects, I don't know what to do. But at one summer, I didn't know what I was going to write that summer. Uh, the life of a professor is pretty good. You get the whole summer off, not to mention Christmas and Easter and all that. 
I was once in a debate here with Gary North. He was saying nobody should become a professor, and I take a very different view of that. I encourage people to, if you're interested, not everybody should become a college professor. I mean, then who would be the plumber and, you know, the carpenter and the farmer? But if you're interested, I encourage you to do that. So anyway, I got a whole bunch of American economic reviews, and most of it was just statistics and mathematics, and the rest of it was all new market failures. So... Uh, the mainstream just loves market failure, but the um, I have to give credit where credit is due to the um, to the uh, Chicago types. Is there any more paper? Oh, thanks. We should really have more paper here, but I guess we're electronic nowadays. Who knows? In any case, here is um, here is the mainstream uh, antitrust um, thing. Marginal cost, demand curve, marginal revenue curve. Here is point C for competition. And here is where the marginal cost and the marginal revenue equal. So that, how many people are familiar with this curve, uh, this diagram? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Well, here is um, profit. And here is the evil dead weight loss. Dead weight loss. Well... Uh, this dead weight loss is a is a comparison interpersonal comparison utility. You see, it's one thing to say that uh, this is twenty utils, this is ten, and this is five. It's quite another thing to say that uh, this is twenty utils for me, and it's uh, thirty utils uh, for for this gentleman. Now we're getting into interpersonal comparison utility. I see you in not I see you like with a baby, you know. <laughs> I have grandchildren now, they're six months old, so I'm going, mm, you know, not that kind of ICU, but interpersonal comparisons of utility. What they're really saying is that the area under the demand curve is how much people value the product, and the area under the marginal cost curve is uh, what it costs society. And since uh, the perfect competition has got QC and, and the monopolist has got QM, uh, the monopolist is engaged in, uh, what is it, um, withholding? Uh, uh, failure to um, to uh, trade, restraint of trade, right? And this is just the interpersonal comparison of utility. For example, let's take Djokovic, the uh, tennis player. According to this, and I'm now going to try a reductio ad absurdum of this, uh, Djokovic should really be pe playing in um, 30 tournaments a year, but he's only playing in 20 tournaments a year. So he values... Uh, we value the extra 10 tournaments, the area under the demand curve. It only costs him the area under the, um, sorry, we value the extra 10 tournaments that he's not playing in based on the area under the demand curve. It only costs him the area under the cost curve, so he's cheating us out of dead weight loss. I, I mean, this is grotesque. But to give credit to the Friedmanites, what they say is, well, we shouldn't always have antitrust because antitrust costs something. And if the deadweight loss is bigger than the antitrust cost, well, then we should pursue an antitrust case. And if it's the opposite way, then we shouldn't pursue it. You can see that this is a full employment bill for economists. Now we're going to try to measure these immeasurables. Another reductio ad absurdum is, uh, if you really believe in this crap, um, <laughs> you have to oppose monogamous marriage. Okay, so I go over to a married woman, I say, hey, check, I notice my wonderful um, uh, uh, approaches to women. Hey, chick, let's go to bed. And she says, no, I can't, uh, I'm married and I'm monogamous. I say, ah, restraint of trade. <laughs> <laughs> She's monopolistically withholding her services. <laughs> the bitch, I mean, you know, she should... <laughs> She should go to bed with me, and if not, I'm going to pursue an antitrust case against her. I mean, this is ludicrous, of course, although the New York Times, if they just heard that much, they would say, block favors uh, suing women who won't go to bed with them, <laughs> which is a whole other idea. I'm not saying that seriously. I, I was just kidding. <laughs> I'm making a reductio ad absurdum, and the reductio ad absurdum is, you know, this restraint of trade nonsense. Okay, what else do we have? Um, 
market process, yes, um, we, uh, the, the mainstream uh, loves equilibrium. Equilibrium is great. Equilibrium is wonderful. Well, you know, Austrians also have the ERE, but it, it's sort of a, um, a heuristic device to think clearly. You know, we assume we're at equilibrium, and then we let one thing change, and then in our minds we try to figure out what the effects of that are. So there's nothing wrong with equilibrium, but what the mainstream does is they make a fetish, a cult. They're a bunch of cultists. <laughs> <laughs> They make a cult or a religion out of equilibrium. What's true or what's not true at equilibrium? Oh, and then we, we notice that the, the real world isn't always at equilibrium? Well, then that's market failure. I mean, that, that's just uh, preposterous and crazy. Uh, another one is indifference. The, they love indifference curves. Um, here's an indifference curve map. So here we have... Um, an indifference curve set, and here is apples, and here is bananas, and here is a uh, hundred utils of um, stuff, and here is two hundred utils, and three hundred utils, and you get some sort of budget line that goes like that, um, and you get an equilibrium point. How many are familiar with this? From okay, well, the problem with this, and, and there's nothing wrong with this if you have it as an isoquant. Uh, an isoquant would be, here is an input, uh, say, skilled labor, here is unskilled labor, and here is, um, I don't know, 100 shoes, 200 shoes, 300 shoes. The only problem is the smooth curves, but there's nothing wrong uh, per se with, with this. But uh, Austrians have a, a grave difficulty with indifference. Why? Indifference is a perfectly good word. Look, um, I, I was given this uh, pad by Anton, and there's a whole bunch of sheets here, and I just picked the top sheet, but I could have picked the middle sheet, and, and if, if they weren't attached, it really wouldn't matter to me. I'd be indifferent as to which sheet of paper I used. Uh, we're going to have lunch soon, and uh, you're going to go get a, a bottle of water or a can of Coke or something, and there's a whole bunch in the refrigerator, right? And you just sort of can close your eyes and pick one. You're indifferent, right? So the word indifference has got a perfectly good English, perfectly good English words. We know when the word is used properly, and we know when the, use, the word is is not used uh, properly. There's a girl here with a, a capitalismo in uh, in Coca-Cola language. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Coca-Cola. There are 20 bottles of Coca-Cola. You pick one, so it's indifferent. So we're not. A, I'm not supposed to call for questions because I've only got 45 minutes, and we're going to have questions later. And I think I have an office hour today. So if you have questions, come then, and then we're going to have uh, panel discussions with questions. I don't know. They used to make it an hour, and I, you know, I had a hard time keeping this within an hour. So if I have questions, it'll slow me down. Okay. What was I talking about? <laughs> Oh, indifference, indifference, right. right. I'm getting senile. You have to work with me. Pretty soon I'm going to start drooling, and then the people in the front row are going to be in trouble. The drool goes. And... Okay, so anyway, uh, indifference. Look, in physics, work means um, uh, uh, force over distance, or rather uh, weight over distance. So if I hold out two 10-pound barbells like this, and if you've ever tried it, for the first 15 seconds, it's easy. But then your hands start dropping. And you're, if you keep holding, I mean, even Mike Tyson or, you know, some strong guy, well, make it a 25-pound barbell, it's really hard. And yet there's no work in the physics sense, right? Because as long as uh, there's no movement, there's no work. And yet you're dripping. So what I'm trying to say is that there's an ordinary language where this is work and we have indifference. And then there's a narrow technical language, like in physics, that, where this is not work. And also in, in Austrian economics, indifference is, is uh, ruled out of court. Why? Because it's incompatible with human action. Human action is a book written by the guy with whom I shook my hand. And remember at the beginning of the... Right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> indifference... me. It, Human action is incompatible with indifference because when I bought this wristwatch, I paid 50 bucks for it, let's say. I valued it at more than 50 bucks, otherwise I wouldn't have bought it. And the guy who had them, he had plenty of watches, he valued the 50 bucks more than the watch. Namely, you can't establish indifference through human action. Nothing that you do can establish indifference. Right now you're sitting here, from which I deduce that you valued this class, fools you, more than what you could have been doing, and I don't know what you could have been doing, another class, uh, biking, swimming, eating, whatever. 
Uh, but you can never establish indifference. So Austrians have a, a thing uh, against indifference. Uh, let me, uh, oh, costs. One last thing, the cost curves. At the beginning chapter of every textbook, intermediate, um, intro, the first uh, chapter, they talk about costs being the opportunity cost or alternative cost. What the true cost of this is, the foregone opportunity. The next best thing you could have been doing, you're not doing, that's your cost. And now all of a sudden, we have these things. Cost curves. Now, where the hell do you get cost curves? These cost curves are objective. Namely, in the fifth chapter or the tenth chapter or wherever they introduce cost curves, we forget all about opportunity costs. And on the basis of this, we start suing people for antitrust. Uh, thanks for your attention. My time is up.